Lightbearer Ministries International presents Hebrew at Study. Let's get into today's message with evangelist Norman Poole. Hallelujah, praise Yah. Let's open up in prayer. Thank you for all joining us tonight. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this opportunity once again to give your message. And may the people who come to listen to this message be blessed by what they hear. And may they walk it out in their lives as you would have them walk it out. And we thank you, Father, for this in the name of Yahushua Mashiach. Amen. So we come to part three on the biblical teaching of tithing. And uh, if you haven't listened to part one, part two, oh, I recommend you go into our podcast YouTube channel and listen to it. So without further ado, let's get right into the message. Part three. I'm sure you all heard this. God loves a cheerful giver. Or, you know, who loves a cheerful giver? He does. We will address not the technical, biblical, historical laws about tithing, but rather the crucial issue of one's attitude towards giving offerings to Hua. And Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses six and seven says this For this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according to his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. This verse states that Yahuwah loves a cheerful giver, so all believers should experience a certain joy or sense of cheerful fulfillment at being able to give an offering to Yahuwah, whether it's a large one or a widow's mite. This passage also tells us that he who sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he so bountifully shall reap also bountifully. This injunction uses an agricultural metaphor to make a point that even as you can't expect to reap much if you sow only a little seed in a field, you can't expect to reap much from Hua if you give very little to him. Yahushua himself addressed one attitude towards giving. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and doth, rust doth corrupt, wherein thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And you shall state in Matthew 6 that only one should lay up treasure in heaven rather than here on earth. In verse 21 he adds, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It is true that whatever you focus your consistent financial investments or giving, you will have your heart in those things in which you invest. The usual statement makes it clear, all should give enough to their treasure to Yahuwah to have their heart in the matters of Yahuwah's kingdom and his work on earth before Yahushua Messiah's return. However, it should be noted that while the language of those scriptures are exhorting a generous spirit Towards one giving to Yahuwah, the word tithing does not occur in the passage. The wording and fears that it's up to the giver what to give, and that the more you give to Yahuwah, the more treasures you will build in heaven for your ultimate reward from Yahuwah. Yusha did not simply say, pay your tithes, as if that was all there was to the matter of giving. I think futures of churches have given thought to this. Psychology of giving, as is mentioned in Second Corinthians nine verses six and seven in Matthew chapter six verses nineteen through twenty one, which you read earlier. Both patches passages in fear that the amount that each person should give to Yahuwah in the New Testament times is determined by the giver, not the arbitrary tithing law specified a fixed percentage. Indeed, Second Corinthians nine and seven states, Let every man give according to his purpose in his heart. That is a clear statement that Paul saw the amount to be given to Yahuwah as a voluntary offering, because of whatever amount a person was able or willing to give. Paul nowhere says in the epistles, pay your tithes, even though many modern churches and religious organizations who are on the receiving end of tithing actions makes it sound as if it did. 
Many churches assert a claim to tithes of everyone's money, even though we have seen above seen that mandatory tithing applied only to agricultural produce and was intended only to support the Levitical priesthood, as they butchered animals for sacrifice. There is no evidence in the Bible and the Jewish commentaries that I cited earlier that wages or salaries were ever subject to mandatory tithing at any time in biblical history. Of course, Paul commended his churches when they gave offerings and donations to him to support his ministry. He nowhere asserted to claim and demanded tithes from any of them at one time. If people required to pay a a tenth of an income to Yahuwah, no matter what, I'm sure Paul would have said that, then that act of giving a tithe to Yahuwah is not really a gift to Yahuwah, but rather simply a payment of a church tax, much like one pays a secular tax to the IRS in the USA, Canada, or some other country, or to other secular jurisdictions in whichever, whatever nation you happen to reside in. Where is the cheerful giving if you are only having to pay a mandatory tithe that you owe no matter what? And he will get, it, get you if you don't pay it. However, if mandatory tithing is not an obligation of believers in New Testament times, and there is no biblical evidence that it was mandatory in the early New Testament church, was Jewish, and they knew the elders who were not, not Levites, those who were offering animal sacrifice, could not demand or take tithes, then everything that you give to you is a gift that you have received happily from the giver. Givers then can give whatever they can in their personal circumstances, knowing that Yahuwah understands their circumstances, and that all their giving is truly a gift to Yahuwah. Obviously, people's circumstances vary widely, and a percentage given to by one giver with joy would cause another giver to deprive his family of necessity if, if the individual did not have the same financial needs as the first giver. Look up tithing in your concordance if you have one. You will see the subject barely comes up in the New Testament at all. It comes up in exchange between Messiah and the Pharisees, where the Messiah made the point that tithing was not going to save the Pharisees, and a judgment no matter how re rigorous they did it. And Hebrews 7 actually discusses that paying the tithe of the Old Testament times. Paul never even uses the word once in any of these epistles. Many refer to the writers of Hebrews as the unknown author of that book, as it is often not attributed to Paul, as the book lacks the standard salutation Paul gave it to us that he's known to give in his epistles. However, Hebrews 7 cannot be used as support for the belief that the New Testament church practiced tithing. He acknowledged mandatory tithing was paid to the tribe of Levi in the time of the judges. But as also flatly, flatly states in Hebrews 7, verses 11 through 12, that the Levitical priesthood could not bring perfection to anyone through the system of animal sacrifices. And adds that the priesthood applicable to Christians was no longer the Levitical priesthood, but rather the Melchizedek priesthood, which verses 14 through 16 states, this Yahushua the Messiah himself, the one who has endless life and therefore has the right to be Melchizedek priest. No New Testament elder had an immortal body, so none qualified as a Melchizedek priest. And of course, no one, have a, no one will have an immortal body until after the resurrection. We've seen this and seen that in Revelation. That they will, that they will become priests, Yahuwah and the Yusha, because they will have any mortal bodies. Paul does write in Romans 12 about various gifts of the Spirit. In verse 8 says that he gives, he that gives, let him do it with simplicity. I think that is inherently teaches that those who are rich enough to have much of the world's goods from Yahuwah are under an obligation to give generously to others, but that they shouldn't do it simply and not in a public manner which draw attention to the giver. Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. Let's read that. Take heed that you do not your alms before men be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when you doest thine alms, do not 
sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or in the streets, that they may have glory in men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Matthew 6, 1-4 teaches that the act of giving should be done secretly, not with the sounding of a trumpet to announce the gift. To put it in modern context, if the gifts are announced at a press conference, that is a modern equivalent of sounding a trumpet to announce a gift and draw attention to the giver. Matthew 6, 1 flatly states that if you are you're giving a public announcement kind of setting, the gift will, will receive no reward in heaven from the Father. Let's take a look at voluntary tithing. Even though we have seen much biblical evidence that mandatory tithing is not applicable in New Testament churches, there is no question that tithing is very prominent in the Bible as voluntary giving guide. Abraham tithed the Melchizedek in Genesis 14, giving the Melchizedek tithes of all, the booty that he kept in the war from which he had returned successfully. But we also know that the other 90% he gave that as well. So all of it he gave. He kept none for himself. Let's put this in modern let's put this in proper perspective through though. Abraham gave a ten percent thank offering to you in appreciation of Yahuwah's serving the life of Abraham and his people in a battle and giving them a victory. Abraham offered a ten percent gift to Yahuwah from his war booty. There's no way a precedent or commandment that modern wages salary earners should give a tenth of all their wages and salaries to a church or ministry. Consider the extraordinary case of Jacob's tithing viewpoint. When fleeing from his father, Isaac, and his brother Esau, Jacob slept at Bethel and saw in a dream that he was sleeping at a portal where angels ascended and descended from heaven. You see this in Genesis 28, verses 10 through 22. Remember, in our study earlier, that Jacob said he would give a tithe to Yahuwah if Yahuwah met a certain list of conditions that Jacob set for Yahuwah to do on his behalf. What is unspoken here is that Jacob recognized no obligation to tithe anything, but saw the act of tithing as a conditional choice that was up to him. If you had made tithing a mandatory law in the patriarchal times, you would have told Jacob, Stop, Jacob. You owe me that tithe, and you cannot set conditions on whether you will offer it to me or not. You must pay it no matter what happens to you. Obviously, you have said no such thing. You did not object. For Jacob to give Yahuwah a list of blessings in Jacob's life, Yahuwah would have to meet before Jacob would give Yahuwah a tithe. Indeed, Jacob did not pay the tithe until many years later, when all his conditions were presented to Yahuwah were satisfied. And so in this example, there is clearly no support for any tithing laws in the patriarchal times. However, these two cases do indicate that giving 10% was an established giving guide once a person decided to give a gift to Yahuwah. Yes, it was a guide, not mandatory, just a guide. Now consider the case of Joseph. When Joseph was warned in a dream that Egypt would enjoy seven bountiful years of harvest, followed by seven very lean years where there would be very poor harvest, Joseph established a system where one-fifth of all Egyptian crops, again this was an agricultural assessment, was given to Pharaoh for stockpiling surpluses for lean years. A one-fifth assessment of the crops was a 20% levy. In other words, a double tithe of the crops. This special double tithe was imposed not as a gift to Yahuwah, but as Egyptian secular tax to prepare the national crisis. This infers that the Egyptian secular national tax was 10% and that the Jacob doubled the agricultural tax due to the extreme threat facing the nation. In this case, there is no precedent here that a secular tax, which was doubled to face a national emergency, had any applicability to telling a modern wage salary earner that they owe 20% to a government, much less to the church. Indeed, when one considers the sum total of income, property taxes, and excise taxes, plus your FICA taxes paid by American modern wage salary earner to the government, many if not most wage and salary earners already pay far more than 20% of their earnings to the government as a secular tax before they even get to the point of setting what to give a Christian church and ministries. People listening to this study 
and other nations likely pay an even higher tax of tax to the government. If they live in European nations with high government benefit programs, and I mentioned earlier, Sweden, I think, is right around 70%, 78% is tax. As documented above, the only mandatory taxes ever demanded by Hua, if anyone in the Bible, is mandatory tithe of agricultural products produced each year on the Israelites' estates, protected by a jubilee year protection. And those tithes were paid only by the eldest son who owned the estates. Younger sons were never subject to a mandatory tithe. These men offered an offering to Yahuwah as they were able, based on how the Lord had blessed them and their income each year, as I quoted earlier in Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. Yahuwah clearly left it up to the majority of the men in ancient Israel to decide for themselves what percentage of their annual income they will give as an offering to Yahuwah. So how should Christian churches be financially supported today? The answer to this question is very simple and easy to see from a biblical perspective as the New Testament book gives a clear answer how the early Christian churches' ministries were financed. The biblical practice of the early New Testament churches should be the practice of modern churches as well. They were not financed by mandatory tithes, but rather by free will donations, free will offerings. One is struck by the fact that the Messiah's death and resurrection and the passing of the Old Covenant, that the subject of tithing never even comes up in the book of Acts or any of Paul's epistles. Tithing was a support system for the Old Testament sacrificial laws that only the Levites could do, and those sacrifices were all terminated for Christians when the New Testament, the New Covenant, began with the Messiah's death. The writer of Hebrews does mention the tithing in Hebrews 7, but does not state or even apply that New Testament church elders could be receivers of tithes. Hebrews 7.11 acknowledged that the Old Testament Levites had a commandment to take tithes of the people. An agricultural tithe, remember. But the Levitical system of animal sacrifices could not bring perfection to anyone. And Hebrews... 7 verses 11 to 12 states the Levitical priesthood was changed to a Melchizedek priesthood. But it adds in verse 16 that one in Melchizedek priesthood had had the power of endless life. That means an immortal life. That disqualifies you and me. That eliminates all human beings from being in the Melchizedek priesthood as we are all mortal beings subject to death. Only Yahushua, Messiah, had the power of endless life in him. So he alone is the Melchizedek priest of the New Testament church. The Levitical priests all offered blood as part of their priestly duties for forgiveness of sins. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, as stated in Hebrews 9.22. Yahushua, Messiah, offered his own blood for the sins of all mankind, and has offered his blood, you are the Father in the holy place in heaven. You can see this in Hebrews chapters 11 through 14. So it is Yahushua Messiah alone who is the current Melchizedek priesthood. Even if the New Testament church elders were part of the Melchizedek priesthood, which is not asserted in the New Testament, there is nothing in Hebrews 7 which states, due to the change of the priesthood to the New Testament elders, it is the New Testament elders who now have a right to demand tithes from the people, even though they are not Levites. This is not how. That is how many tithe receivers like to interpret Hebrews 7, but it's clear that Hebrews 7 made or inferred no such statement. People who do this are twisting scriptures. And believe it or not, they are doing it to their own demise. If Levitical tithing had been opposed by Paul and other elders in the Gentile church found by Paul, there would have been an uproar about it in Paul's epistle and would have been a central issue of Acts 15. So the Acts 15 conference about the aspect of the Old Testament law would have been applied to the Gentile brethren. Tithing never came up as an issue at that conference. Evidence that it was a non-issue at the time because no New Testament elder claimed to have a right to ask or demand tithes from other believers. That is wholly logical as all the apostles were observant Jews, had known all the lives that no non-Levites could demand or accept tithes. We are told in Acts 22, verse 33, that Paul himself was a 
premier scholar of a biblical law who was personally taught by Gamaliel, a most learned sag of the Jews at that time. No participant in this apostolic conference even considered the possibility that tithes were owed to New Testament elders who were non-Levites. Further, Paul did not hesitate to tell his congregations that if he knew there were no sins among them, when a member of the Corinthian church was practicing incest, Paul wrote to them that it was a sin and the members would be expelled from fellowship. You can see this in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 25. If not tithing was a sin, Paul would have directly told his congregation it was a sin to withhold tithes. He would have commanded that tithes be paid to him and other elders. However, Paul never made any such statement in any of his epistles that New Testament believers owed any tithes to church elders. However, we do see Paul clearly asserting a right to expect donations from the church he founded to support his evangelical efforts. Paul clearly was disappointed that some of his churches didn't donate to him to support his ministry. We see in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 4-14, through 14, Paul asserts he had a right to expect donations from those of whom he had preached and served spiritually. Paul obviously in chiding the Corinthians for failing to send donations to support his ministry. Paul commended the Philippians for being the only church congregation which regularly sent donations to support him. You can see this in Philippians 4, verses 15-19. Paul also told the Philippians that there were times when donations to him was either lenient or abundant. You can see that in verses 11-12 of chapter 4 of Philippians. Keep in mind that Paul was an itinerant evangelist and he had no mailing address. Sometimes, he would have been hard to find, even by those who were trying to bring him donations. A man named Ephroditus was a Philippian who got very ill as he tried to find Paul to deliver donations to him from the Philippian church. Paul wrote in Philippians 2.25 that Ephroditus had come to minister to Paul's wants and apply your lack of service to me. That sounds to me like Paul had received a donation via this to this man who literally got himself sick tirelessly trying to find Paul so he could give him the donations of the Philippian church. Donations at that time did not consist of running a check to a postal address of a church or a ministry. It would have been highly dangerous to transport actual money, gold or silver coins, to Paul as such an offering would have invited the attention of robbers who preyed on travelers. The donation sent to Paul was most likely were more non-perishable foodstuff, clothing for all seasons, and other items of value that Paul could use or sell for money to support his ministry. Paul was a skilled talit maker. He made prayer shawls. Yes, we mentioned that this earlier in Acts 18, 13, and Acts 20, verses 33 through 35, indicated that Paul took employment as a King James Version a tent maker, but in the Hebrew, it's a talit maker. And he worked with his own hands to minister his own necessities during times when no one donated to him. Paul had a job to support his ministry. And he was a full-time minister, and yet he worked. Paul also taught that he would love the cheerful giver, and that each man should give as he proposes in his heart. Second Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says this. In these verses, Paul writes... He that sows sparingly also shall reap sparingly. This passage shows Paul reminding the Corinthians that Yahuwah can bless them if they give more, but a statement that each man should give as he purposes in his heart confirms that Paul neither required nor suggested a fixed percentage or giving for anyone in the New Testament church. However, the scripture has much in it that indicates that this was not an injunction by Paul to give anything to Paul, but rather to gently donate to the poor saints in Jerusalem who were suffering through famine, an event that is referred to in Romans 15, verses 25-28, and 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1-4. Let's read 1 Corinthians 16, 1-4. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whosoever ye shall prove by your letters, 
Then will I send to bring your liberally, liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Some modern Christians think that Paul's reference to the first day of the week in this passage means that Paul was referring to the Sunday church service. Many known Hebrew roots no, this is not the case. Paul was a devout Jew who was faithfully kept the seven-day Sabbath commandments. You see this in Acts 13, verses 42-44, through 44, Acts 16, 13, Acts 17, 2, and Acts 18, 4. Paul kept the Sabbath. Paul knew the first day of the week was the first work day of the week, where common labor could be done. What Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1-4, through 4, was the laborious working of Boxing up the collection of food and other items for the Jerusalem believers should be done on the first day of the week because it was a common work day when the local Christians could work to repair the donated items for safe storage on a ship that would be transport the donated items to Jerusalem. The conclusion of this point is that while Paul never asserted a right to demand a acceptable tithe, he did assert the right to receive a voluntary donation from the congregations that he raised up and served. While the Philippian church sent regular donations, Philippians 4.15 indicates that they were only congregation that gave regular donations. The other churches sent intermittent don donations. Sometimes Paul had to work as a talit maker to support himself with donations were sparse or non-existent. Based on the biblical example, New Testament churches were supported by voluntary donations, not tithes. However, since tithing is a biblical example for giving in certain cited cases of voluntary offerings, as in Abraham and Jacob's case, if a modern believer chooses to give a tithe of whatever gross or net income that they receive, it is entirely their right to do so. But no one should give so much so that they violate the paramount commandment of 1 Timothy 5.8 that you must provide for the financial needs of your own household as a top priority. How often should offering be collected? Here again, we will find a major divergence between modern Christian practices and biblical commands. The Israelite oldest sons who gave tithes and the younger son who gave offerings, not tied to any fixed percentage, did so three times a year, as stated in Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. This is because of Yahuwah's command to all the tribes of Israel to keep his biblical holy days outlined in Leviticus 23. These holy days, seasons, were structured by Yahuwah as a harvest festival. Livestock, row crops, tree crops, etc. all had different seasons of the year in which they were harvested. Some will be harvested in the spring, and tithes or offerings will be given by all the male heads of the household. And the spring holy days pass over in the days of unleavened bread. The second harvest festival, which is in the summer, is the Feast of Weeks. It is now often referred to now New Testament time as Pentecost. The final and the largest harvest was gathered in just prior to the fall holy days, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. While the Israelites would be offering sin offerings, peace offerings, etc. throughout the year, he would not only require the Israelites to give their tithes or main offerings three times a year. This further confirms that the Old Testament tithing applied only to agricultural produce as no estate owner could calculate what his tithe was until the harvest had actually been completed, so he could calculate a tithe of the amount harvested. Leviticus 23.39 confirms this point, as it says the Israelites should keep their holy days after they had gathered in the fruit of the land. Modern Christian churches tend to have an offertory as part of their each weekly service church services. Some may have it every service. So every day, or every time you go to the service, you're asked to give, give, give. But modern churches call for people to give tithes and offerings to you of 52 times a year, a minimum, and sometimes a whole lot more, usually on the first day of the week. Even though Yahuwah mandated tithes and offerings to be collected only three times a year during a biblical harvest festival, however, one cannot make a direct parallel on this matter between the ancient and modern believers. Ancient harvests were gathered in at three major times of the year. 
so tithes and offerings were given three times a year. Modern wage earners are paid throughout the year on varying pay periods. So it's logical to give people a chance to make their offerings to their churches at any time during the year. In the time of Messiah, the Bible does give another method whereby offerings could be given to Yahuwah. Mark 2, verses 41 through 44, records a famous episode of the poor widow throwing in her two last mites. This had very small value in that day into the treasury, the collection boxes at the temple. At that point, it is evident that people could give offerings at any time of the year by placing money into the collection boxes of the temple for gathering such voluntary donations. Keep in mind that the Jews of Yahushua's time were under Roman law, not Yahuwah's Torah law. There were no longer 48 Levitical cities, no jubilee years, estate protection, etc. A temple priest made the collection boxes available so people could make donations to the temple at any time of the year. The system was not commanded in the Bible, but it also be noted that Yahushua did not criticize it either as Yahushua knew their society was not governed by Israelite kings and the Torah laws, but rather by Roman laws and whims. If we apply that same principle to modern Christian churches, all Christian churches should place collection boxes in their buildings onto which parishioners could place donations at any time of the year. This would eliminate the need for an offertory as part of each weekly church service. I have known of modern Christian churches which use the voluntary collection boxes as means of receiving donations instead of of where they collect it during the service. But the Bible gives no specific direct direction of the right way to collect donations in the New Testament churches. Can tithes be used for welfare purposes in U.S. theocracy? The Bible has a verse which specifically says the answer to the question is yes. Deuteronomy 26, verses 12 through 13 states that the third year of tithing each tithe year, the oldest son who controlled the crops of the entire nation of Israel was to give his tithe to the Levites, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat and thy gates be filled. Verse 13 states that each tithe gather, giver was to make a confession to Yuha that he had given portions of his tithe to the stranger, the fatherless, and the widows, as well as the Levites. This refers to a broad use of the tithe in the third year. So it's evident that every third year in ancient Israel the tithes were required by Yuha to be given to the poor and needy as a welfare program in addition to giving portions of it to the Levites. While consulting Jewish ref reference sources, it is apparent that a controversy exists between the application of, of this tithe. The tithing cycles are divided into seven year cycles, six years of tithing, followed by a sabbatical year where no crops were sown and no tithes were gathered or paid. The controversy is about whether the third year designated only the third year in a seven year cycle or whether it referred to every third year, which would mean that the special use of the tithe for a welfare program would include both the third and sixth year of the tithing cycle. I do not know which is the correct application, but I lean towards the later one as being the accurate one as even Yahushua observed the poor you always have with you. So there would be a pressing need for the poor to be provided for twice in a seven-year cycle instead of just once. Tithing on gross income or net income. Let's take a look at that. This subject was touched on earlier as we talked about the rendering unto Caesar, but let's examine this in a more in-depth with a biblical Torah point of view. This is for those who, in spite of the scriptural evidence presented in the book, as that prince said in it earlier, still feel that they are obligated to pay a tithe in New Testament times. Like many listeners to this study, I once tithed rigorously to a church I was attending, and at one point was giving up to 50%. However, now I do it as a voluntary act, and that is the obligatory act, as I was once taught. The question would inevitably come up whether one should tithe on one's gross income or their net income. Tithe receivers obviously benefit more if people tithe on their gross income, but it is this viewpoint consistent with biblical principles. The answer is very clear, no. Leviticus 14 verses 22 states that the ancient Israelites were told, You shall surely tithe all the increase of your seed that the fields bring forth year by year. First, let's make the point that this verse again states that only agricultural production was subject to the mandatory tithing law of ancient Israel. 
No other category of income or increase, such as wages, inheritance, legal judgments, spoils of war, etc., is listed as being subject to mandatory tithing laws. However, notice also that one is the tithe on one's own annual increase. According to this, in agricultural terms, if Israelite began a year with 100 cattle, and at the result of his calving season, at 150 cattle, at the end of the year, his increase is 50 head of cattle to his tithe, would be 5 heads of livestock. If storms, poultures, or disease wiped out much of his herd, and he ended the year with just 100 head of cattle, he had no increase in his herds at all, so we, he would owe no tithes for that year. Let's apply this to a wage earner. As a wage earner, you work for a certain amount per hour, or maybe you are salaried. You have made an agreement with your boss that you would give your time for that specific amount of money. So you gave your time to work for your employer, and later you were compensated the amount of money for your agreement. In reality, there was no increase. There was equal exchange. Your time for his money. No increase. Let's look at from this point of view. If a person earns 40000 a year and ends up at the end of the year with increase in money on hand from his labor, he could tithe on that increase. However, if the same person had a difficult year and earns 40000 but has no increase in actual money on hand at the end of the year, why would he or she owe a tithe? Are they not like a farmer who ends up with the same amount of cattle at the end of the year and therefore has no increase in which to tithe? Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at this. Look at it this another way. When Abraham offered Melchizedek ten percent of the captured war booty, as stated in Genesis fourteen, he gave the tithe as a thank offering to Hua for victory in war, for his survival in combat. He gave ten percent of whatever was under his direct control. His allies in that war may have tithed or not. The Bible doesn't tell us. When Israelite tithed on their agricultural production. They tied on all the produce and livestock increase that was under their direct control. If a wage earner or anyone else with any other kind of income today wishes to voluntary tithe, they should likewise tithe on whatever is under their direct control. However, our society is radically different than the ancient biblical society. Ancient biblical societies had no federal or state income taxes withheld from their paycheck. They did not have FICA taxes or Medicare taxes deducted from their wages either. No gross income is under their direct control due to their governmental mandated taxes. Only net income is under a wage earner's direct control. One's gross income is a statistical book entry item only. It does not represent how much money is actually received by a person which is under their direct control. Indeed, one's actual income tax obligation is not really known until one's taxes are calculated at the end of the taxable year. So it's impossible to calculate your actual net income until you have finished calculating your federal income taxes for the previous year. If you're a homeowner, you're also required to pay property taxes to your local municipality, county, or school district, and other tax jurisdictions. What about sales tax, phone tax, excise taxes, gas taxes, liquor taxes? And we've, we've heard about cigarette taxes, etc. No taxpayer had any control over these expenses either, so they should also be deducted from one's total income to arrive at one's true net income before calculating a tithe on it. If you disagree with this logic, here's your test for you to try. If you decide that your entire gross income is under your direct control, then you have option to refuse to pay your income taxes, property taxes, etc. You will quickly learn that the real world, i.e. the government tax and jurisdiction, does not agree that you have real control over your gross income. People have gone to prison for thinking that they control their portion of their income that government demands of them in taxes. Yusha stated in Matthew 22, verse 21, could be paraphrased as saying, pay your financial obligations to the government first, and then calculate your religious financial obligations afterwards. To conclude this point, there is no biblical or practical support for a viewpoint that one must tie the day on their gross income. However, you can decide to voluntary tithe, and that is up to you. Tithing in one's net income makes far more biblical and practical sense if you choose to voluntary tithe. Those who believe that New Testament believers are subject to Old Testament tithing laws that were intended solely to support the animal sacrificial system should keep the following point in mind. If you are 
going to literally apply the tithing laws of ancient the theocratic Israel to a modern world, you should require tithes only on agricultural products, and you should exempt everyone from paying in tithes during eight years of, out of every 50-year time cycle. However, everyone is free to do whatever they want to do with their money. If you believe you are required to calculate a tithe based on gross or net incomes, you should act according to your conscience and understandings of Yahuwah's word, not mine. What is Yahuwah's address today? We know in the Old Testament. We know where it was at because the Bible tells us. But what about today? Whatever you have purpose in your heart to give Yahuwah, the question then becomes, where do I send it? Or to whom do I give it to? In ancient biblical times, when mandatory tithing was in effect, Yahuwah literally did have a known address where tithes and offerings would be brought or sent. Although, keep in mind, most tithes and offerings brought to Yahuwah in ancient Israel were either agricultural products such as flocks and herds or animal sacrifices, not money. In the times of Judges, Yahuwah's address was a tabernacle building in Shiloh where the high priest dwelled. The Ark of the Covenant was located in where the priests and Levites performed temple services. And Joshua 18.1 records that the tabernacle was placed, in, placed at Shiloh not long after the Israelites ate, entered Canaan. 1 Samuel 1, verses 3-9 and 24 is an example of Shiloh still being Yahuwah's address. Approximately three centuries later, these scriptures show that Samuel's mother and father, before Samuel was conceived, went to Shiloh for one of the annual feast days and, and to sacrifice unto the Lord in Shiloh. Throughout the year, ancient Israelites could also have gone to one of the 48 Levitical cities at which sin offerings and other forms of offerings could have been made unto the Le unto Yahuwah. See Joshua 21. When the first temple and the second temple were built, they became the center of worship in ancient Israel and Judea in the second temple times. And the temple times, were these were Yahuwah's address during the times they were in existence. After the destruction of the second temple, Yahuwah has not had a focal point of worship on the earth as his address on the earth because each and every one of us is the temple of Yahuwah and we're all at different points on the earth. Jews have had synagogues in their communities and Christians had churches. They've had church buildings and denominational offices for almost 2,000 years since the second temple fell. Today there is a dizzying number of church denominations, ministries, local churches, ministries, missionaries, outreaches, and so on, to which churches and Christians can give their donations. It is entirely up to the individual believer what to do with the donations he decide to give to you. Paul's epistle certainly demonstrates that he asserted that he had a right to expect donations from those churches he founded and ministered, although it seems Philippi's congregation was the only one that sent donations regularly. Believers have to have the option to split up their donations to give to a number of worthy recipients if they decide to do so. Galatians 6.6 6 gives us a good guideline for giving. The King James Version translated is, is rather garbled, but the Amplified Bible translation is clear in stating. Galatians 6.6 6. Let him who receives instructions of the word of Yahuwah share all good things with his teacher, contributing to his support. I think it's also worth Remembering that Yahuwah's ancient mandatory tithing laws, he made provisions for portions of the tithe to be given to orphans, the widows, the poor, the needy, every third year. Based on the precedence of Yahuwah's own word, modern believers can also remember the needy in dispensing the gifts of Yahuwah. Proverbs 19.17 is supportive of this principle. Conclusion This study is hardly a comprehensive examination of the subject of tithing but it should provide enough information to the listeners to see how complex this issue is and that modern church teachings on tithing bear little resemblance to biblical teaching on the subject and the actual historical practice of how tithing was actually performed. This research reports offers a serious discussion of the many questions about tithing that modern, modern Christianity, modern churches have glossed over and not seriously considered for far too long. We find strong evidence that you have never commanded a second or third tithe in ancient Israel, as some would teach. This study has also documented that only agricultural produce was tithed in ancient Israel, and the only oldest son who owned agricultural estate paid the mandatory agricultural tithe. 
Everyone else gave an offering based on their ability to give, not a fixed percentage. There is no evidence in the Bible that salaries or wages were ever subject to mandatory tithing laws at any time in biblical history. There is no biblical evidence in that mandatory tithing was commanded or practiced in the New Testament churches by anyone. One could not find any junction in New Testament books that believers paid or owed tithes to anyone. Christian churches and leaders like the Apostle Paul did assert a right to receive voluntary donations from the churches and the people they spiritually served. Those who say ancient Israel tithing system literally applies today are left with this reality. It must be paid only by farmers and ranchers who enjoy jubilee year rights to their land. They will pay an agricultural tithe that would be spent eight out of every 50 years. All others would simply give offerings as they are able, and everyone should make their offerings just three times a year. However, no farmers or ranchers enjoy jubilee year property rights anymore, so they are not subject to mandatory tithing laws today either. Also, mandatory tithes could only be demanded by and given to Levites who perform animal sacrifices. 1 Samuel 8 reveals that Yahuwah abolished his own tithing laws when he turned over all his kingly taxing decisions to Israel's future kings and is cited above. Jewish sources recorded that biblical tithing systems came to an end at that time. Paul taught in Hebrews 7 that the human tithe receiving Levitical priesthood was abolished when Yahushua, the Messiah, assumed the divine Melchizedek priesthood in behalf of all the believers. There is a New Testament ministry of elders, but there is no biblical evidence that any church elders demanded or received tithes in the early church. However, Paul did assert that he had a right to expect donations from the church as he had raised up and served. Therefore, it would be consistent with Paul's writings for modern churches to be funded with donations and offerings, but not mandatory tithes. If a person wished to voluntarily give a tithe, there is nothing wrong with that, and there is and there are biblical precedents that a tithe is a good giving guide if one can afford it. However, the choice to do so should be a voluntary one. You should warn us not to judge each other. So churches and individuals must not condemn the sincere belief of those who hold divergent beliefs on tithing. Romans 14.23 tells us to live according to our own faith, so each person must act in accordance with his personal conviction regarding tithing and make an offering to Yahuwah. Also, Yahuwah made it clear in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4, that all acts of giving must be private matters between the individual and Yahuwah, their God, with no public publications about the gifts. All acts of giving should be between you and Yahuwah. So I hope this examination of the subject of tithing from biblical historical prospects has been helpful to you. Hallelujah. So, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to give a study on tithing. It's been a very extensive, long study. And I thank you, Father, that those who have listened to this study have a greater understanding of what tithing is, what it was, and what it is still today in accordance with your word. Not in, not in accordance with what man says, but what does your word say? You know, the difference between tithing and the difference between giving offerings. And uh, what were the requirements of then and, and of now? I thank you, Father, that those who have listened and that those who have heard have a greater understanding and they will walk out your word with what you are telling them to do. And am I telling people to stop tithing to their churches? No, I'm not. If that's what they want to give, and they want to give it cheerfully, let them give. If it's off their gross, if it's off their net, or anything else. But if they believe they're not supposed to give a tithe or an offering off their earnings, let them give what they believe they should give. Some believe it's 20%. Some believe it's 30 40 50%. Because if you're making a mandatory 10%, that's all the people are going to give. But maybe the people want to give more. But they're only told to give 10, so they don't give no more. But if they're going to give what you're telling them to give, it might be 20, 30, 40, 50% or more. Maybe it'll only be 1%, such as a woman with the 
widow's mite. She gave her all. And to us, it says, that's little. But yes, it was little, but she gave it all. She gave 100%. So whatever we do when we give, let's, let us all give with a cheerful heart. And I just thank you, Father, in the name of you, Shabbat Shalom. Amen. So I thank you once again for joining me. And uh, we'll be here with you again next week, same time. And, but since we did give a study on uh, tithes and even on offerings, I just want to give an opportunity for you all to, uh, to give into this word. And as you know, the one who spiritually gave to you a teaching, you know, is worthy of his hire. And so I'm not actually hired, but you know what the scripture says. So give what uh, the Father is telling you to give. And uh, I thank you if you do. And, you, and how to give is go to our website, www.light, L-I-G-H-T, bearer, B-E-A-R-E-R, ministries, M-I-N-I-S-T-R-I-E-S, dot org. So lightbearerministries.org. And just look for the, uh, the Give tab. Click on that. And uh, proceed forward with that and, and give into this ministry because all everything that's given to this ministry, I'm not using for my personal use, but I'm using this to propagate the gospel for equipment, for the website, for podcasting, and other things of that sort so that this word can be continually given out. So I thank you for those who give. May you bless you and keep you. Hallelujah. So until next time, the blessing of Yeshua HaMashiach be with you all. And goodbye. Shalom. Thank you for listening to Hebrew Root Study with Evangelist 104. If you'd like to have more messages just like this, Go to our website, lightbearerministries.org, www.lightbearerministries.org.